morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Today is Thursday, September the 30th, and we gather this next hour around the gift of the inspired and true Word of God, and we put on our Christ goggles to study Leviticus chapter 15. Thank you for those of our listeners who are hanging with us throughout Leviticus, and I would say that the next few chapters are vital to understanding Leviticus and how it connects to the rest of the Scriptures, not only in the realm of atonement, which we will cover tomorrow, but also in the realm of of holiness, what does it mean to be holy, and how do we receive this holiness from our Lord? And we went through yesterday with uh, someone has healed from leprosy, but yet they were not clean before the Lord. And today we see once again of, of the need for holiness and a little more of a personal nature, something we don't typically talk about. So I encourage you who are listening today that if you have people who are not wanting to talk more of a personal nature for both men and women, I would encourage you to maybe um, listen at a different time or by yourself, whatever it might be. It could get a little personal here and in the next few chapters as well. But once again, we don't just look at the scriptures, but we know that we also will see Christ right here in the word of God. The gifts are ready, ready for you. Thy Strong Word is graciously underwritten by our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation. For more information of their great work of bringing theologically sound and Christ-centered materials around the world, visit lhfmissions.org, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word, we have with us Pastor Brian Wolfmiller of St. Paul and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas. Pastor Wolfmiller, welcome to Thy Strong Word. Thanks, Brady. Great to be here. Thanks for picking me for this chapter. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I thought, you know what? Who would be the best person to dig deep? And that is you. And here we are. Well, You're excited, though, huh? I am. I am. It's great. Well, there's a lot to learn, actually, here. <laughs> exactly right, Pastor. You are a regular on KFUO, um, but this is our first time together. Can you spend a few minutes introducing yourself, your family, and the work of the saints and St. Saint Paul and Jesus' death? Wow, this is our first time. I uh, I'm yeah, pastor two mm-hmm. congregations here in Austin, Texas, deep in the heart of Texas. Uh, St. Paul Lutheran Church, the mother church here in town, and also Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church, which is a um, c- celebrating now 90 years of deaf ministry. Wow. Uh, the church isn't that old, but we've been doing deaf ministry here in Austin, Texas for, for a long time. I'm pastor over there as well, so have both congregations and rejoicing in that. Carrie and I have four kids, Hannah who's in college at UT. Andrew just graduated from high school. Daniel's a freshman playing football. Isaac is in band and orchestra in the seventh grade. So it's great. Wonderful. Thank you for uh, uh, putting that back to us. And it's it's interesting because uh, I don't really hear a Texas accent yet. Are you doing okay? Are you you picking it up or not? I was born in Kerrville, Texas and grew up for 12 years right down the street from Austin, Texas in the Hill Country. But for whatever reason, I don't know if it's, I moved to New Mexico when I was 12. I spent a couple of years in Australia, kind of on and off. It did, Maybe it flattened it. But do you know my family, my Texas family all says that I pretend that they think I fake a Minnesota accent so that I sound more yeah. Lutheran. I think that's ridiculous, but I don't know. So I'm working on it. So we'll see if a couple well, of y'alls come out. Well, I tell you what, if, if your family needs to hear a Minnesota accent, they just have to listen to me. And it just, no right. matter what I've tried to do, it just keeps coming back. And if they want a copy of How to Talk Minnesotan, I can send them a copy of that book as well in case they wonder if you, because I don't, you don't sound Minnesotan at all. So there it is. Well, thank you. You can prove for me. Thank you. I, I take that? that as a great compliment. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, so <laughs> Pastor, as we are here to search the scriptures, can you begin our time in prayer? Yeah, absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would uh, grant us your wisdom and your courage from your word. We pray especially from this gift of your word uh, to Moses and Aaron and to your people in Leviticus 15, that you would teach us how you make us clean, that you would uh, restore to us the, the a sane and normal view of family, and that you would bless us with the instructions that you gave to your people of old. Through you, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. Amen. 
Reminder to our listeners, if you have any questions concerning Leviticus chapter 15 or other questions on Leviticus, Pastor Wolf Mueller is a great teacher, and so here's your opportunity for him to answer it. Send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, or call us, 314-821-0850, 314-821-0850. Now, Pastor, I really, how you prayed is that important distinction for us is that we need to be made clean. In chapter 13, we hear of the leprous person basically had to yell out, unclean, unclean. And in chapter 14, we hear of how the leper, even though he was healed, was not clean until the rituals that were, that happened. And for us, that's the main theme that we are by nature sinful and unclean. So that really is something we think about throughout Leviticus, why we do what we do. Now for this chapter, um, we want to start off on the right foot. So how do you want to start us off? Well, it's, uh, you know, we have a whole chapter talking about bodily discharges so I'm not 100% sure what the right foot to start out on, although maybe this. <laughs> we should know that as human beings, as male and female, the Lord has created us as uh, sexual beings. And how we, how we treat our sexuality and how we um, think of our sexuality is phenomenally important. I mean, we in our own day are living now at the end, I hope, of the sexual revolution and so this understanding of human beings as, as sexual beings has deep and profound implications for us. But we also want to set this in context of the ancient pagan world, where there was a there's sort of a dispute, I suppose, amongst the pagans about is is our human sexuality a divine thing or is it a um, a despised sort of thing? And the Lord is going to teach us to think of it rightly. And so we're going we're gonna to have a discussion here. Really, there's um, five points of legislation that the Lord is going to make about, bo- about bodily discharges here. And so the first is about male bodily discharges, which are abnormal, and then male bodily discharges that are normal, then discharges in the act of intercourse— That'll be the, so male and female together, and then normal female bodily discharges, and then abnormal female bodily discharges. So that's the sort of structure Mm -hmm. of the chapter, and and it's going to go through and and give regulations. And I think in those regulations, it teaches us how we're to to think of um, male and female, and think of our own sexuality, and how we're to, to understand it. Uh, it also, the the big overarching categories, which you did well to introduce, is this idea of clean and unclean. And it it should be, we should make the note that being sinful or forgiven is different than being clean or unclean. There was a purity that was required for admission into the temple services uh, th- that the Lord had instituted. And so that cleanliness is is not the same as sinfulness. When someone was unclean, that doesn't mean that they had sinned, but they were richly unclean and therefore not fit to enter into the sanctuary of the Lord. And we should make that distinction as well. That's gone away in the New Testament because baptism cleanses us. And so so we don't have the category now for the baptized as clean and unclean. We all are able to approach the Lord's table. There's no restrictions on it in regards to our for example, the bodily discharges, as it's discussing here, or even leprosy or anything like that, the baptism is a delivers a, a kind of a permanent clean, cleanness that that none of the sacraments of the Old Testament could deliver. But so it's so it's just good for us to remember that that there's a there's a distinction between unclean and sinful. They're they're connected, but they're not the same thing. You know, that's a really helpful distinction because we can get lost in the weeds here of trying to figure out, oh, wait a second here, this discharge, why would he have to wait seven days? And what does that mean for us? And we start making the one-to-one, oh, I'm forgiven, so I'm good. Well, that wasn't the same. There was forgiveness in the Old Testament, this forgiveness now, but I love how you put in baptism to understand how do I know I'm clean now? Well, Christ has come to me in the waters of baptism, which we see imagery of this all over the place in the Old Testament. So that is, you know, I really want you to unpack that as we go through, Pastor Wolf Miller, because that is something 
that uh, I probably need help with to to make sure that I'm thinking about that correctly, because that opens this whole chapter up in a new way. Anything else you want to highlight before we begin? No, let's dig into it. All right. Reminder to our listeners, we will be reading from the English Standard Version of Holy Scripture, chapter 15 of Leviticus, and we'll read the first 12 verses. 12 verses. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. And this is a law of his uncleanness for a discharge. Whether his body runs with his discharge or his body is blocked up by his discharge, it is his uncleanness. Every bed on which the one with the discharge lies shall be unclean, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever sits on anything on which the one with the discharge has sat shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches the body of the one with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if the one with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and, and be unclean until the evening. And any saddle in which the one with the discharge rides shall be unclean, and whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening. And whoever carries such things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Anyone whom the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And an earthenware vessel that the one with the discharge touches shall be broken and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. So, Pastor, where do you want to begin as we look at clearly what is unclean? Yeah, what we probably just as know that when it talks about body here, or sometimes that's translated flesh, it maybe should be translated. That's that's the word in Hebrew, but it's um, it's a euphemism. It's a stand-in for a uh, member or the male genitalia here, and we're it's going to mm-hmm. start out with the with a dis with an abnormal discharge from the male genitalia, which I suppose can take a handful of different forms. Normally, it's an indication of disease, and the the interesting thing to perhaps note is that uh, there's a lot of the same um, uh, restrictions that are applied also to leprosy. So it seems like there are some hygienic things that are happening here. Although if we understand this only in terms of hygiene, I think we'll really be missing the point because again, this clean and unclean is not the same as healthy and unhealthy, just like it's not the same as sinner or saint. It's a, it's a different category altogether. It's liturgically ready and fit for the presence of God in the temple. and But we see a lot of the similar um, restrictions, a lot of the similar provisions. And one of the main things here is that this abnormal discharge that it's talking about here, which will be contrasted to, the, to a normal bodily discharge, mm-hmm. this is transferable. So that if someone is spit upon, someone who's unclean spits up in this way, spits upon someone else, or touches someone else or rides in the same saddle as someone else, then the uncleanness passes from one to another to another. Uh, that's not going to be the case with the normal discharge. It's going to not it's going to not transfer both for men and women, which is going to be important for the family life. Also, and I'll maybe explain that the contrast when we get to it a little bit later. Also on this abnormal discharge, there's a longer it, extended period of time, 7 days before a person can be declared clean. And I believe that was the same for leprosy in mm-hmm. chapter 14, although I don't remember the details. Yeah. You maybe can confirm that. But you had this longer time of healing for clean, cleanliness to come along as well. And so and so that's an important part to notice that that this kind of it's kind of a there's a severity to the uncleanness here when when someone is sick in such a way that in his in his genitalia for a man, there's some sort of discharge or something that's happening that's preventing the normal discharge, say of urine or something like that. Then he is he is made unclean and can't go and serve or even participate in the services of the temple. And that's it's really what struck me in this is how 
intricate the details are of you know sitting on a saddle uh touching a bed i don't really know what to do with the spitting thing i don't know if this was a common practice did you see anything on that it was kind of like if he spits on you then you gotta get cleaned you're like wait was there a problem with the spitting or or breathing maybe i guess anything on that they, they weren't wearing masks at the time <laughs> yeah, so right. just... yeah. <laughs> and that was yeah. just something i read i was like that kind of striking you know yeah it is funny i you know you'd um spitting on someone is always an act of dishonor and shame you know right and so so sh- so there is always a shaming someone but there's a way that you are passing on now your uncleanness from one to another i always you know just the i always use spitting as a dis- as a distinction between um uh between physical pain and the and the social pain of shame because mm. if you ask people would you rather have someone hit you in the face or spit in your face? It's interesting that, you know, spit doesn't hurt, but it does. It's a wounding thing. And I've talked to a handful of people where, where like a breakdown in the family started with one person spitting on someone else. It's amazing. Mm, Interesting. So we hear it's one of the hardest things to read in the account of the passion is when the soldiers spit on Jesus and Mm. it, it just makes us angry and, and, upset because of such dishonor so i think it's always kind of hanging around in the background but but here the i think the point is that this abnormal uncleanness is transferable it can go from one person to another i suppose like a disease so like a dead body is unclean and if you touch a dead body you yourself become unclean so if a person is unclean due to abnormal discharges then then that is communicable it can go from one person to another it's um it's uh, it's like freeze tag or something like that. It it just spreads. One thing that's interesting too is that in the leprosy laws, it was seven days outside the camp. You know, so they really weren't even able to be in their own home for those seven days. In this one, they were able to still be at home. If I'm reading this correctly. And so it definitely was very infectious, but it was seen differently than leprosy for sure. And I don't really know the distinction. And I saw that, read that in a commentary. Um, not really sure what that means, but it shows just there's a distinction there, but very similar in the same way. And so this is one of those, uh, we don't really know what this infection is. I read a number of different theories about what it could have been, but it sounds to me like we don't really know. Any Any theories that you read or anything that you saw? No, and you know it probably reminds us of some of the what we would call in our day sexually transmitted diseases, and so mm-hmm. it's it's probably in that family. Um, but it's at least it's a it's a disease that's connected to to sex to sex, and so mm-hmm. th- th- this this is one of the reasons why um, I think this chapter is so important because as delicate as we would like to be about the topic, uh, our human sexuality is in fact part of our, um, I mean, it is the life of our communities and of people altogether. I mean, it's how the next generation comes about. And it, it is a matter here of public policy. (laughs) And Mm. as much as we would like to, to say what happens in the bedroom uh, stays in the bedroom, that's just not the case it's not the case um ever because what happens in the bedroom eventually now becomes the next generation at least if what's happening there is what's right and what's supposed to happen there and so um and so the the fact that we have this legislation of cleanliness and uncleanliness in regards to our human sexuality is is perhaps a somewhat uncomfortable but important point for us to to reflect on and it is important too. I think about, you know, my kids are, and your, and your kids as well, you know, there's some in junior high and they're going through a lot of changes and they go to school. And now this is vitally important for us to be very bold in making some distinctions. And there seem to be very clear distinctions, but here you see it is that there's male issues and there's female issues. And you know, they're not, they're not like graying the order here. And I don't want to get too far into the, into that discussion in our culture, but it's very refreshing here in chapter 15. And we'll see after chapter 16. Um, and later on for our listeners, we'll be going through Song of Songs. 
And, and all of this is, shows the beauty and the ability for us as Christians to speak boldly about these things, because there is male and female differences. Um, these might be personal, but they are definitely something that we should be able to talk freely about. Um, and it's very clear what Scripture has to say. So I, I appreciate how you're saying that, because it is something that we should read and just and just go for it. And, and here we are doing it right now. So anything else before we move on, Pastor? No, now, do you, what's your, just to make a note maybe on the structure of it, so the first section, it, it's going to extend now, I mean, verses 13 to, to and 14 and 15 are mm-hmm. going to talk about the cleansing ritual for this man with, a, with the abnormal discharge. And then when we get to verse 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, we probably want to pause because even though that's just a handful of verses, the structure gets really tight and you can sort of see what, what's going on. And so... Um, so the real break will come between 15 and 16 when, mm-hmm. when Moses and Aaron now go to discussing from abnormal discharge to normal discharge. And, and you yes. see a, a, a pretty big difference between those two things. Very good. That's how we'll follow this. And right now we'll go 13 through 15. And when the one with a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes. And he shall bathe his body in fresh water and shall be clean. And on the eighth day, he shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and come before the Lord to the entrance of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. And the priest shall use them, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. So the the man is is healed. He, he has no issues, but yet he's still not clean. So what's the process that he has to go through? Yeah, there's a way to bring him back into the fellowship of the temple or the, here, the tabernacle, and it has to do always with sacrifice and blood. There's also the rite of cleansing. So laundering clothes, bathing in a stream or a fountain, some living water, some moving water there. Um, and then he's clean. And yet there's still a, so the cleanliness happens when he's washed, and yet there's still a sacrifice that needs to be taken. It's the smallest sacrifice. So a turtle dove or a pigeon, that was the, that was the, the kind of minimum sacrifice. So here it's not a ram or a goat or a bull, but mm-hmm. the, the, the most affordable, the kind of right. least of the sacrifices. But there's two of them, and one is offered, interestingly, mm-hmm. one is offered as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. So they're offered in two different ways. That's sin. Th- this is different kind of categories of the way that the offering was treated. Uh, one, the priest would eat from. I believe the sin offering would be available for the priest to eat from, and the burnt offering was totally consumed by the fire, and so mm-hmm. the priest received nothing from, from that offering. And so it's kind of a split offering. One is completely offered. The other is partially offered. The blood is poured out, and the meat goes to the priest to support his work. Uh, and then it says you'll make atonement so that, that there's now a way for for this man to come and stand before the Lord. And and this is maybe the big point and how this all points to Jesus. I and mean, every time there's a sacrifice in the Old Testament and the blood is spilt, we, we are to see and to rejoice in the, the truth that the Lord is now accepting the death of another in my place. So these doves... And these pigeons did nothing wrong. They didn't sin in any way. They didn't have any uncleanness or anything wrong with them. In fact, if they did, they wouldn't be able to be used as an offering. They had to be un- they had to be perfect, uh, unblemished in that way. And so the Lord is now accepting the death of another in my place. And always this preaching of atonement is pointing to Christ. Because we know the blood of bulls and goats and lambs and pigeons and everything else that was offered on the Jewish altar could not forgive sins, but it could preach the forgiveness of sins that would come by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so these these little pigeons are are now little pastors who preach in their death the absolution and the forgiveness of sins that comes from Christ. And so as you look at that, it, it, it doesn't say it, but he makes atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. Is now this man who was healed, now was clean, had, was, was atoned for by this blood, which obviously points us to Christ. What was he now able to do that he couldn't do before? 
Well, if he was a priest, he could go about his priestly duties. And if he was not, if he was a layman, he could go into the tent. He could go and make offerings and sacrifices and go and worship the Lord there in the tabernacle. Uh, so he was restored to the fellowship of the of the church and the, and the preaching of the gospel and the sacraments uh, in the under the old covenant. So, so that access to the Lord's presence, to the holy place and the holy places, was restored in this uh, in this act. And it's interesting to me because you have so so many. I mean, that it's really hard not to get overwhelmed as you were talking about the sin and the burnt offerings and how does this all look. I mean, I'm amazed at the priests and how much they were doing almost every single day. <laughs> you know, there's always there's always a new offering to give. There's always a new sin to be forgiven. There's always something. And we haven't gotten to the Day of Atonement yet in the book of Leviticus. And so the list goes on and on, which is quite amazing to think about how how um, that need to be clean was so intricately detailed for them. And it's hard for us to understand because, as you said, we know we are clean by the blood of Christ that we receive in baptism, that the blood of Christ makes us clean. The robes of righteousness, the garments of salvation all covers us. So it's hard for us to understand, but also should make us give thanks. So, Pastor, we have about a minute left here before our break. Anything else in the first 15 verses? Sure. I mean, just to piggyback on your point, this seems like, I suppose, a lot of rigmarole for us who are not used to it, but it should remind us that you cannot just waltz into the presence of God. That is not safe. So mm -hmm. the Lord is making, through all of these um, institutions and appointments and requirements, the Lord is making a way for his people to approach him in a, in a, uh, without being destroyed, without being wiped out by his holiness without being consumed by his fire and so as the lord is instituting these things he's he is putting that to work that he wants to be with us and bless us but that it's not a, simply a matter of waltzing into the presence of the lord but in fact the the way that he's appointed it is to stand before him only when we've been cleansed by the blood well, we want to talk more about that. We get to some more fascinating passages to come. But once again, as Pastor Wolfmuller has said, they are important for us as male and female for our, for our culture throughout time, but also because we are in Christ. So we need to take our break. We are studying Leviticus chapter 15 with Pastor Brian Wolfmuller, and we'll be right back. You hear our voices every day as we speak the gospel, share the latest news, or for insightful and sometimes entertaining talk. Why not share your voice with us and send us your feedback, suggestions, and questions? Leave your comment at 314-996-1542. Be sure to follow us on social media, too, so you can like, comment, and share your favorite posts. Drop an email to KFUO at KFUO.org or send a snail mail letter to Worldwide KFUO, 1333 South Kirkwood Road, St. Louis, Missouri, 63122. Thursday on Issues Etc., we'll discuss outreach to the blind with Daniel Jenkins of Lutheran Braille Workers, and Pastor Jonathan Fisk will lead us in a teaching on Proverbs 30. And on Friday, it's This Week in Pop Christianity with Chris Rosebro and Issues Etc. Soundbite of the Week. Issues Etc., live weekday afternoons from 3 to 5 on KFUO. The next Sing for Joy celebrates creation. We can't use color, water, earth, or sky. Such things do not work on radio. But we will use music. Join us for music that gives thanks for the beauty of the earth. Sundays at noon on KFUO, the messenger of good news.
And welcome back. We are studying Leviticus chapter 15 with Pastor Brian Wolfmiller. And Pastor, we are to come upon, as you said, a distinction. Now we're moving from the abnormal discharges to normal discharges. And that's an important break for us to make. So I just wanted to make sure, is there anything else you wanted to share in those first 15 verses? I think that uh, by, con- you know, the contrast from the abnormal and the, and the uh, oh, maybe, maybe this, there is a way that this cleanness and uncleanness has to do with life and death. And, and especially when it comes to our, to the act of marriage and to our human sexuality, there's a lot of life that's involved there. And yet it can be brought over into the realm of death. And so if people are just, they're not functioning in the normal way for a man or for a woman, then that means that there's no life that will come. And so this clean and unclean often has to do with these two realms. And the Lord's temple is always the realm of life. But, and here's going to be an important distinction, the Lord's temple is the, 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 the tabernacle and is where he causes his name to be remembered to come to us and bless us. That's going to bring, that's going to bring life. But there is no place for intimacy or human sexuality in the tabernacle. And some of the um, restrictions that we're going to see in the next few verses, we're going to make sure that there's no, just to say it as plainly as possible, that there's a distinction between sex and worship. And that's going to set apart the Lord's tabernacle from a lot of the temples in the ancient world, which we can discuss uh, a bit. Uh, Even the Greek world, the Roman world, the the Canaanite gods, the Egyptians, the, the Persians, they would a, a lot of times be tempted or would actually do it. They would have some sort of some some sort of prostitution or sexuality connected with the with their place of worship, with the altar. And th- with the restrictions that the Lord is about to put in place, he makes sure that that does not happen in Jerusalem. So let's see more about that, because that is a distinction that we'll see is do not do this like the Canaanites, you know, do not do this like others throughout Leviticus. It's very not not a ton, but that is a, a definitely an overwhelming thought of they do this. We do not do this. That makes them unholy. This is what we do as holy people. So let's 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 do this. Let's go through verses 16 through 18. We'll stick with the men for now and talk about the normal discharges, as you said. If a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and be unclean until the evening. And every garment and every skin on which the semen comes shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. If a man lies with a woman and has an emission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. So it's yeah. you know simple words, but can be quite quite uh, I guess explicit for our culture. So your thoughts? So the sixteen and seventeen talks about just a man alone, and if for whatever cause there's an emission of semen, he this is a, again not abnormal, but somewhat normal. So it's not a disease or something like this, but it's rather the the, the normal way that things work. But if that is um, if it's out in the open then he's unclean and everything that the semen touches is unclean. There's a washing required for himself and for anything that is then therefore contaminated and and that lasts through the day. So here there's no sacrifice needed. There's no going to the temple. There's no waiting mm. period of seven days. Um, there's no, no need to destroy anything, but rather there's a simply a time of uncleanness that follows this particular have we lost them? I think we lost Pastor Wolfmeyer. We can't lose Pastor Wolfmeyer right now. Right now, he was on a roll. We are in verses 16 through 18 of uh, Leviticus chapter 15. And as we look at this today, he's right in the middle of talking about how you have the normal discharging of a male. And so however this happens, semen has come from his body. And now he is one that is having to be clean. And all it requires is for him to be washed and then to the evening. Now the question comes, which is interesting to me, then verse 18, if a man lies with a woman and has an emission of semen, both clean and unclean, um, of both 
uh, with a woman in mission of semen, both of them shall bathe themselves in water, be unclean until the evening. So once again, this is something where they are not, uh, uh, they have not done anything wrong. I mean, this is assuming that this is a husband and wife. This is assuming that everything is in order, but they are therefore needing to be unclean until the next day. There is, uh, there is no um, issue of, of sacrifices needed. There's no sin offerings. So this isn't immoral. But I found this interesting just because in our culture, when we think of sexuality with a husband and wife, we see this as a holy thing. But here, just simply by that fact, they are seen to be holy. So I'm going to keep moving forward. We just have to wait uh, for if Brian Wolf Mueller is coming, trying to come back on. We're still working on that. So let's move on. You got on. me here. I think I'm back. Can you hear hey, me? Hey, now you're back. Now you're okay. back. Not a problem. So Sorry you were that. on a roll. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know either. And that's usually what happens. And we keep moving forward. So 16, 17, just talking about that. Verse 18, I was kind of talking about, I was talking about it, but it talks about a man and a woman. Um, I'm assuming that this is a, uh, a, a marriage, that they, they are married of some sort, uh, that they have had sexual relations, but yet they're unclean. This is kind of confusing to me when we read this, especially when we see male and female um, sexuality as a holy thing. So any thoughts on verse 18? Sh- sure, absolutely. So so the idea is that um, the, the, the semen that is emitted by a man in the act of intimacy is to is to be buried into the woman there to become one flesh it's not supposed to be spilled anywhere else and so it's not it's talking about if there's something that happens in the act of intimacy in such a way that there's semen that's spilled and ends up outside instead of inside I suppose is a way to say it then that is uncleanness so it's pointing oh, okay. to the fact that that the that the um in the act of intimacy that that, that creation is to come forth and th- this is the proper use of of um, of semen of sperm. This is what's supposed to go on. And so, if it's misused, or if there's some attempt to, for example, to prevent fertilization or something like that, then that is an act of uncleanness. And even if it's accidental, it's it requires a time of waiting and becoming um, waiting to clean. And even though it's only one verse, we should understand that verse 18 is the center of the whole thing. So we have a long section on unnatural or abnormal uncleanness for men. And then we have a couple of verses on natural uncleanness for man. And then we have men and women together in the middle. And then we'll have natural uncleanness for women and abnormal un, uh, unclean, uh, abnormal discharges for women. And so we have this chiastic structure. And this is right at the center. And this is the important point, is that what is the proper use of a, a man and a woman in intimacy it's it's conception and bringing forth children and anything that disrupts that or stands in the way of that the lord is going to say that's that's a an act that results in uncleanness and that's what's going on here there was practice i mean we were talking about the pagans and the pagans had some wild ideas about blood and sperm and these two mm, fluids would be used in various different pagan rites and rituals and all this sort of stuff. So the pagan temples would have all sorts of things happening with these bodily fluids. And the Lord is going to say, mm, no, th- uh, these are here for for making babies, not for any sort of strange cultic worship stuff. And so while the Lord does approve of husband and wife lying di- down together, uh, and the act of intimacy is a good work. It's what is protected by the sixth commandment. You shall not commit adultery. Mm-hmm. Uh, it here points to the the fact that the goal of intimacy is. Mm, I don't, I got to be very careful with the language used here. But the, so the goal of intimacy is is children, not satisfaction. It's one of the problems that we face in our own day, is that we've taken the the goal or the culmination of of sex to be the enjoyment that we experience that we experience in in the act rather than the purpose for which the lord put it which is bringing forth children now there are other benefits too especially as husband and wife are bound together in this unified act and so forth there's other benefits that come along with the act but the the telos of the deal, of the whole deal 
is the life that comes about in the next generation. And so the Lord is, is, is highlighting that in these, um, in these restrictions here. I appreciate your honesty and your uh, forthrightness. Uh, we had Dr. John Kleinig at the beginning of Leviticus, and he and you and I know him well. You, you know him even better, and and he and he's pretty forthright in this. And he would have said the same thing with a little more of a gusto, I guess you would say, from him. But it was a good reminder for us of the. It's very forthright. I mean, you can't say, "Oh, well, I'm not quite sure." No, it's pretty clear what's here. And I kind of miss the emission part of verse 18. Like you said, it is a it is it is a central point of what he's trying to get at is the goal is the next generation. The goal is the joy of having children. And I'm going to share this story just because I think it's an important thing for all of us is when we were going to have our first child, I have four children, and we have our first child. We found out that we are pregnant with my oldest, who's now in 10th grade. And we had a lot of people from church talking about, oh my gosh, you know, you're, it's going to be tiring. You're going to be wore out. You're going to have children, all this kind of stuff. And then later on, um, I told a, a person that had had a very rough life. He had a very rough life, a divorce. His wife left him. You know, he had very physical issues, everything else. I would work out in the gym and he would be there. And I told him about my, you know, my wife being pregnant. And he said, it's the best thing you'll ever do in your life. And I think that's important for us as Christians to be able to speak faithfully about the holiness of things. So it's, it's a good thing um, when we're having children. <laughs> so don't speak down upon it like it's this burden. No, think about the life for the next generation. And although this is a little more explicit than how we would talk, it does show the importance of a husband and wife having children and to not let other things get in the way of that. And we don't want to go too far with that. I don't, we don't want to get into some of those ethical debates here. But it's very clear as Christians we promote children to the next generation. So any last thoughts before we move on? Well, yeah, because so that if, if sex leads to, to life and the Lord's arranging of things, then in the devil's perverting of things, then sex will lead to death. And that's exactly what we see. I mean, we live in an age where, where intimacy is so disconnected from childbearing that most of the time, it doesn't even have the possibility of childbearing. For example, if you put a, a man and a man together or a woman and a woman, there's no, there's no even possibility of, of a child being brought about. Uh, and, and then we have the horrible um, business of abortion, which says that I want to be able to have sex, but not children. Like sex is the good thing and children are the bad thing. And to, to get that, you have to have, you have, to have death enter in. And so this whole business of clean and unclean and life and death and our human sexuality is not, it's not like this is a, an ancient problem and something that now we've come to deal with. No, this is a, this is a problem that is, if anything, amplified in our own day because we have understood, uh, we have pursued sexual liberation by trying to liberate ourselves from the goal of sex, which is the next generation. And that is not liberation at all. It is a bondage to death. And it's hard for the world to see it because the, the devil always peddles um, slavery disguised in freedom. So if I'm free to pursue whatever sort of pleasure I desire, I, that, that must be true freedom. But, but we know better who have the mind of Christ that that, that is, in fact, death, and it leads to death. I mean, not just in in theory but in actuality there's millions of babies that are are murdered never come to to breathe or or see the 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 face of their mom and dad because of this whole disconnect between our uh, human intimacy and marriage and life and children and family and so the, these um to think wrongly about this has severe consequences I, we'll move forward. I do encourage our listeners, you our listeners, to look up the book by John Kleinig, wonderfully made, A Protestant Theology of the Body. And he speaks very, um, very faithfully about such things, about how we view our body is how we will view holy things from the Lord. Obviously, one of them being children and our sexuality and why it's good for us to be able to speak faithfully about that without embarrassment while understanding all of it is a gift from our Lord. But, Pastor, we better move on. Sure. Let's go through 19 through 24. 
when a woman has a discharge and the discharge is in discharge in her body is blood, she shall be in her menstrual impurity for seven days. And whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean. Everything also on which she sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. Whether it's in bed or anything on which he sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lies with her and her menstrual impurity comes upon him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which she lies shall be unclean. So my first reaction to this, Pastor, is that uh, the reality is uh, that uncleanliness or uncleanness does not discriminate. It's for men and for women. Your thoughts? That's right. And it's important, again, for us to say, is this mean that uh, the menstrual cycle is somehow sinful? And the the answer is absolutely no. Remember, the difference between clean and unclean is is very different. Here, just like in the distinction between the abnormal discharge from a man and the normal discharge, now this is the normal discharge for a woman, and in a minute we'll get to the abnormal discharge, that this is not uh, transferable by her body, but rather simply by the blood. So just like anything that the semen touched or the um, uh, from the man that then became unclean. So now anything that the blood touches becomes unclean, but she herself is not unclean. And so the, here the, um, the wife goes about her normal business, but um, now f- free from any sort of sexual activity during the time of menstruation. And again, the, the, the point is that the, um, intimacy is to bring forth life. And here during that particular time, there's no life that will be brought forth by that act. And so that act now becomes an act of uncleanness because it doesn't bring forth life. Uh, and, and I think that's probably the, the simplest way to, to, to look at it, just like the, the, the semen that was spilled. So now the blood that was spilled, it, it doesn't result in life. And so we, we want to look at, uh, just like Adam looked at Eve and said, your name is Eve, because you're the mother of all the living so that we husband and wives want to look at each other with that gleam in their eye to, toward life and toward the next generation and toward the gifts that the Lord gives in that way through marriage. Maybe one other point though, and, and this has to do with to, to circle back around when I think I got disconnected on, on the mm-hmm. pagan use of these things. So the pagans would take semen and blood and use them in their ritual acts and and here the Lord is forbidding any of that kind of paganism because the only blood brought into the temple is the, is the blood of the animals, the blood of the sacrifice. Never the blood of a woman or the blood of a, of a human at all in any way is, is not used in, in any ritual way. And the danger of becoming unclean in the act of intimacy from verse 18 would forbid any sort of intimacy happening in the, in the Lord's holy place. So, you know, you hear about like Corinth or even the temple they built in Jerusalem in the time of Jeremiah or or anywhere in the world, they would have all of these temple prostitutes serving. And th- 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 this restriction makes sure that that does not happen, that the proper place for this, that, that, so that sex is not a sin, but neither is it a holy act. It's a common act that is good. And that's the proper place for that's the proper understanding of it that the Lord is shaping up for us uh, again in these requirements that are here. So, so the proper place is at home, and uh, and that's just good for us to remember. Let's continue to move forward, twenty-five through thirty. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of her discharge, shall be to her as the bed of her impurity, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, as in the uncleanness of her menstrual impurity." Whoever touches these things shall be unclean and wash, shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, she shall count for herself seven days, and after all this she be clean. 
On the eighth day, she shall take two turtle doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest into the entrance in the tent of meeting. And the priest shall use one for a sin offering and other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before the Lord for un- her unclean discharge. Well, I'm there and Pastor, we only have a few more minutes with this because I really want to get to these last verses. But I wanted to make sure that there's anything you wanted to add in this. What you, what you said, abnormal. Would this be abnormal discharge or this would be normal right. discharge? How would you define that? No, this would be abnormal discharge here. And this would okay. be uh, a menstrual cycle that just doesn't stop. Like, like we hear the woman who was bleeding for 12 years and who mm-hmm. Jesus heals. She touches his garment and he heals her. It's a beautiful story. And that she would have been an example of this kind of affliction. So just like the man who had some sort of disease. So now this is some sort of disease. And you see that the cleanliness has a um, comes after the bleeding stops, but there's a waiting period and an atonement that's offered before the, this woman being healed is able to go back into the, into the temple. So there's a, a parallel here between the first case and this last case. And so anything else you want to share in those verses? No, I think that's good. Okay, so let's move on. I'll read the rest, 31 through 33. Thus you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. This is a law for him who has a discharge and for him who has a mission of semen, becoming unclean thereby. Also for her who is unwell with her menstrual impurity, that is for anyone, male or female, who has a discharge, and for the man who lies with a woman who is unclean. You know, what? one of the thoughts I have here, uh, Pastor, is there's two things. Is first of all, this is very earthy. You know, it's definitely very, um, it, it, it perks, our, perks our ears a little bit, maybe makes us feel a little uncomfortable, but also is something that we need to be able to do as Christians, is to be able to talk about real world things that are happening. And also we see the cross and the, the depth that our Lord is able to, was willing to go for us. But also then verse 31 is very much so showing this is how God's people are holy as opposed to others who are not holy. And you're really breaking that down well for us is the other cults or other religions that, you know, sexuality was part of worship. And here he's separating that, that unholy things they would do to, quote, make them holy, you know, kind of two negatives don't make a right or two wrongs don't make a right kind of situation. And here he's being very explicit about what is holy and what is not. So that separation part is, I think, a very important key here as well. Your thoughts? Yeah, the Lord's people are different than the pagan people. This has always been the case. It's something that we need to remember. The, Jesus teaches us a new way of being human. And while these particular laws no longer apply to us, there's no restriction, for example, for a woman who's uh, having her period to come to the Lord's Supper. The, the, those, the New Testament, the, the gift of baptism gives sort of a, a permanent cleanness to to all of us in this way. We, it's good for us to reflect on these things and what it means then for our for our humanity and our sexuality and our being male and female, things that you're not supposed to even talk about nowadays, but are in, fantastically important. And, and it helps us navigate the confusing uh, business of our sexuality, because it is such a profound gift that the Lord has given, that he's divided up humanity into male and female, and he's, he's made it to where the coming together of the two, in fact, creates new life. It's, it's quite an astonishing thing is that we are tempted to either to exalt that to such a high degree that we, we, we involve it in our worship and, and we worship sex itself, or we despise it and we run from it, we're horrified by it, it becomes something that can't even be discussed, and we're probably always vacillating between these two things, between obsession and disgust, between, between awe and um, frustration, in all of this. And so the Lord wants to say, look, this is to, to, to put our human sexuality in the right place, which is in marriage, uh, the gift of a man and a woman bound together for life in the context of the generations in bringing forth of children. It's not a holy thing, but neither is it unholy. It's common uh, and a gift from God. This is this is good for us, and we probably need this wisdom more than ever because our world is about as confused as you could be when it comes to man and woman and husband and wife and 
intimacy and w- what it means to have a body, uh, we are about as mixed up as we could possibly be. And so these kind of things are very helpful for us to gain some of the wisdom that comes from the, the one who made us male and female and the one who gives us these great gifts. I want to ask one question from our listener. I'll give you a minute here, Pastor. And the listener asks this question. Is sanctification today an actual separating of the believer from the world's uncleanliness of the culture? Does that make sense? Yep. And I think in some ways, yes, absolutely. Um, But in some ways, it's impossible. So one of the things that Paul talks about is that he talks about separating ourselves from the sexually immoral. And then he clarifies it. He says, but I'm talking about brothers, those who call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ, because if you were to separate yourself from the sexually immoral of the world, you would have to leave the world altogether. So there's a there's certain degrees of separation that we want to engage in. So we always want to sanctify our own minds, our own imaginations, our own hearts. We want to be very careful with our own bodies. We want to have a high standard for our own family and for our brothers and sisters in Christ and the church. And then we want to be very careful when engaging in the world that that the uncleanness and the sexual immorality in the world doesn't doesn't creep in on us. And yet we always want to be as Jesus was finding those people who are who, who are wounded and wrecked by breaking the sixth commandment. I mean, consider the prostitutes whom Jesus would would forgive and and invite into the fellowship of his love. That we always want to know that it's the Lord's redeeming grace that that cannot find anybody who has out sinned his mercy. I mean, the Lord goes into every corner of the world with the light of his gospel and the redeeming hope for all sinners. And, and he comes along and says, hey, what I've called clean, you do not call unclean. The forgiveness of sins makes us clean. Pastor Brian Wolfmiller of St. Paul and Jesus Deaf Lutheran Church in Austin, Texas, giving us God's strong word from Leviticus chapter 15. Pastor Wolf Mueller, thank you for the gifts. Thank you. Saints of our Lord, we need to be made clean, and the Lord directs us very clearly that we are not clean. And today we spoke about this uncleanness in a more personal level, but yet it's something important for us to remember, that our Lord Jesus has created us male and female, made us different, but it is no discrimination in that we are unclean, and how do we become clean? by the blood of Christ through the waters of baptism. Look to him and receive this robe of righteousness. I'm your host, Brady Fenner, pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands.